So um, last time, uh, we, I told you that we were going to take a detour and we were going to talk about center of mass, So which, which is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to continue that detour. And hopefully, we'll finish that detour as well. So um, I mentioned how <clears throat> there are all these variables that show up in our equations that we've talked about in the past, like F equals MA. Well, the A is actually A sub CM. That CM stands for the center of mass. So this is the acceleration of the center of mass. And you know, you, you may have seen uh, P sub CM. This is the momentum of the center of mass. And so we have to be able to understand what those are. Now, if if we're dealing with a, with a problem where the system involves more than one object, well, then these, uh, Sorry, if we're dealing with a system where the where if we're dealing with a problem where the system involves only one object, then basically you can just treat like the center of mass of the object as the position of the uh, as the position of the object and so on, and the mass of the object is just the mass of the object. But if your system's complicated, has more than one object involved, then you need to start asking what does the m in f equals m a mean? What does the m in one half m v squared mean? What does the v mean? And so on and so forth. So the easiest thing, and this is what we talked about last time is if you're talking about a system with a bunch of different objects in it, the m, if m shows up in any of your equations, that's the total mass of the system. It's just the mass of, or the, the combined mass of every of every object in the system. Now, <clears throat> what I left you on a, a cliffhanger last time is I told you that for the positions, for the, se uh, for the center, of, that's a terrible r, the center of mass position, r sub cm, the center of mass velocity, v sub cm, the center of mass acceleration, a sub c, and these all might show up in your uh, like in in a given problem, right? Because if your if your system is large, then you might have to use these if it, if it involves more than one object. So these all depend on a place, or where the where the subcomponents of your system are. Like if your system is the Earth and the apple, r sub c m will depend on both where the apple is and where the Earth is, and it will depend on the rate at which those those places change. So let's first talk about this notion of center of mass as it just applies to a bunch of point masses, a bunch of tiny little uh, balls of mass that are just every which way. Let's talk about a collection of particles. So the center of mass of an object or a collection of objects is, in a sense, it's it's a location. And it's, in a sense, it's just the average position of the objects. So center of mass, by the way, will often be abbreviated either COM or subscript CM if it's in a subscript. So if that's what you see, that's what we're talking about. So center of mass is roughly, I say roughly because it's not just like you add them all up and divide by the number of objects. Um, the average position so that is to say center of the the center of mass is a place like you could say that the center of mass is there or it's there the center of mass of this pen is here the center of mass of this phone is here, the center of mass of these keys might be here, not here. So the center of mass is a place in space. And it's it, it doesn't have to actually be inside of the objects that we're talking about. For example, if you had like a hula hoop, the center of mass would be at the center of the hula hoop, like, like at the center of the circle. Uh, uh, in mathematics and two-dimensional objects, I believe it is also called the centroid. Um, it is related to the density. So, so for example, if you had a hula hoop, the center of mass would be like here. It wouldn't actually be inside the physical material of the hula hoop. So it's just some abstract place that is, or that would be the location where all of the mass is if all of that mass were concentrated at a single point. Yes, yes. So let's let's look at an example where we have just two very, very small objects. Let's say that this position, or we're going to use a coordinate, so this direction is plus x then we have this particle at x1 and this particle at x2. These are just their x coordinates. So if, and let's give also give them both mass. So you guys can probably guess that if the, um, we're going to get into all of this detail today. 
you guys can probably guess that the center of mass of these two objects, if, if the masses are the same, would be halfway between them. And you'd be right, right? Like your, your intuition for center of mass is that it's the place where you have to let, like if you, if you had a dumbbell, for example, it's the place where you have to put your finger to balance it. And so your intuition might tell you, you have to put your finger halfway between the two masses. Alternatively, if the masses were not the same, then, well, the, the center of mass might not be there. Where would you have to put your finger to balance this rod? Well, you'd have to put it closer to the heavier one. And so in that sense, you not only are you taking an average, you're kind of, uh, you're weighting, no pun intended, you're weighting the heavier objects more, the more massive objects. So they contribute more to the center of mass than the lighter objects do. And again, that should kind of agree with your intuition. Like if you have a, uh, where's that flashlight? Um, okay, I can't find a flashlight. Ah, okay. Fly swatter, right? So fly swatter, it's, it's, its heaviest end is this side, lightest end is the other side. So I don't have to put my finger halfway down the uh, fly swatter. It's, it's actually like much closer to this end than it is to this end. And so that's because the heavier end contributes more to the location of the center of mass. So what we want to do is we want to uh, formulate, in a sense, how we, or we, we want to come up with a formula for how we would compute um, <laughs> there was an annoying fly in here the other day. I never actually found it. Um, how we would want to compute the uh, the center of mass, like where actually is the center of mass based off of what the based off of the positions and the uh, masses of these objects. So in fact, we define for this two object system that the center of mass x coordinate or the x coordinate of the center of mass. In this case, we're only worried about the x coordinate is the ratio of the mass of one object to the mass of the whole system times the position of the first object, plus the ratio of the mass of the second object to the mass of the whole system times the position of the second object. So the, why do we do that? Uh, that's an interesting question. We can talk about it afterwards. That's an interesting question. So the reason we do that is because if M1 is like 99% of the mass, the center of mass, or sorry, 99% of the total mass, the center of mass should be near X1. And so we just weight the positions by the fraction that that object contributes to the total mass. And this ratio is that fraction. It's the, it's the fraction of the mass of M1 to the total mass. This ratio is the fraction of the mass of M2 to the total mass. And so we can actually simplify this a little bit and we can write it as M1 X1 plus M2 X2 divided by capital M. Now, by the way, when I write capital M, usually that's going to refer to the mass of the whole system, unless it's otherwise obvious, um, like especially for multi-object systems. So if you see capital M, that's, that's what it stands for. So just to be clear, and I did say this already once, but the position XCM, this place, it, like, and that is a place, it's a coordinate, it's, it, it, it's, it's a distance from, the, from X equals zero, right? that place is not a physical location. Like there isn't actually something there, right? It's just a useful math tool that says where the object would be if all of the mass were concentrated at a single point. Yes, in this case, capital M is little m, little m1 plus little m2. Uh, it's just the total mass. So what happens if we have more than two particles? And what happens if these are strewn all about three-dimensional space rather than just one-dimensional space like along the x-axis? Well, then we can write the center of mass position vector, RCM, that would just be the x coordinate of the center of mass in the i hat direction, plus the y coordinate of the center of mass in the j hat direction, plus the z coordinate of the center of mass in the k hat direction, right? That, that, that's, that's all the center of mass, that's all the center of mass position vector is. And so then we can just write out what these are, use, generalizing this, this notion. And by the way, the pattern is just that you keep adding plus m3 x3 plus m4 x4 and so on, right? That's what you would do if you have more than two objects. So we can simplify this. It would become m1 x1 plus m2 x2 plus dot, 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 standing for however many objects you have in your system or particles in your system in the i hat direction plus m1 y1 plus m2 y2 plus dot, dot, dot in the j hat direction plus m1 z1 plus, oh no, it's not going to fit m2 z2 plus dot, dot, dot in the K hat direction. There we go. <laughs> the R in uh, it, so so that's a position vector, and then we divide the whole thing through by m. Really, each of these terms should be divided by m, but we just distributed, or we factored rather. So 
we can rewrite this. This is m1 x1 plus y1 plus z1 plus, uh, sorry, that's not right, x1 i hat plus y1 j hat plus z1 k hat plus m2, all I'm doing is regrouping by the way, m2 x2 i hat plus y2 j hat plus z2 k hat plus dot 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 as you know however many terms you have wait a minute where did my capital m go in the previous line there should be a capital m there in the denominator there we go um and then we divide the whole thing through by m that stays the same but then notice that this is the position vector of the first object this is the position vector of the second object and so on and so this just becomes m1 r1 plus m2 r2 plus dot 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 divided by m and maybe you expected that this isn't really a surprising result it just generalizes the notion that we did for one dimension in the x direction so this is our standard formula for the center of mass display or the center of mass vector center of mass position vector r so you would need to know the masses of all of your objects. You need to know the position of all of your objects. But then you can just compute the center of mass by doing this vector addition and multiplication and so on. OK, so this is what happens if you have a whole bunch, a, a, a finite number of uh, infinitely dense point particles strewn throughout space. right? But we don't actually work with point particles. Like real life things are not point particles. This is an extended object. This phone is an extended object. So we actually have to ask the question, what if you don't, what if you, instead of having a collection of point particles, what if you have a collection of like real world extended objects? Well, it's actually fairly easy. So if you have a collection of objects, all you need to know is you have to know where the center of masses of those objects are, and then you can find the center of mass of the whole system fairly easily. So if your system has multiple objects, I'm going to say extended objects, meaning they're not just points. <clears throat> we can also find that the center of mass easily. So to do this, you would need to know what say this, the center of mass position of say the first object, object A, the center of mass position of say the second object, object B, and so on. You need to know where those things are. So like the picture is, is you know, you have a brick over here with maybe a center of mass here. Actually, I'm just gonna label the point rather than the vector because I don't wanna have to draw the whole vector. This is the center of mass of say B. And then maybe you have like a sphere over here with maybe a center of mass here. And those are going to be, those are points in space. So they have corresponding position vectors. And if you know where those points in space are, then you can relatively easily find the center of mass of the whole system. The center of mass of the whole system is just the weighted sum of the systems or uh, of, of the individual objects. It's just say MA RCMA plus MB RCMB plus dot 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 divided by the total mass, capital M. This is, uh, and well, just to be not, just to be clear, I'll do MA plus MB. So all you do is you just take a weighted average of the center of masses of the individual parts. So with this in mind, once you know, once you know how to, um, if you know how to find the center of mass of a given object, like where is the center of mass within the object, then to find the center of mass of some complicated system, you just First, find the center of mass of each object, and then find the center of mass of those centers of, centers of mass. The only thing now is, how do you find the center of mass of an object that isn't a finite number of particles? Um, <clears throat> yeah, it gets a little bit harder. Uh, although we could probably, well, OK, we can talk about that. That is a really interesting question, so please stick around, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. So the question then is, is, how would we find the center of mass of this block or of the circle? Right? It's not a collection of point particles. So we can't just add up the masses and the positions, right? It takes a little bit more work. These are what are called continuous objects, meaning that they aren't made up of a finite number of finite mass objects, at least like, uh, at least from an ideal perspective, they aren't. In the real world, they are. 
every object is made of atoms, and we could, in principle, find the center of mass of, or find the uh, the location of each of those atoms, and then just apply the center of mass formula to those to get the center of mass of the object. But there's a lot of atoms, and they're so small, we can just treat them as if they're infinitesimally small, and that there's an infinite number of them. So for what we're about to do, we were we are only going, going to work with objects that have obvious, say, centers of mass in two of the three dimensions. So in principle, you could find the center of mass in all three dimensions for some arbitrary object, but it gets complicated. And you guys haven't taken, um, I think it's 21C. 21C is where you would really get into this, where you start doing volume integrals and things like that. I don't think you guys have seen that, so we're not going to worry about it. Um, but so like a good example, oh, it's 21D. OK, a good example of this, of an object that it, that has obvious center of centers of mass in two of the three dimensions, that would be something like uh, a baseball bat, right? We know that the center of mass of a baseball bat is going to lie along the, uh, the like the axis of rotation. The question then is, is where along the long side, like here's our, this is going to be a terrible baseball bat. That looks more like chicken. But like the point is, is the center of mass will be somewhere along this line. The question is where along that line is it? And that takes a little bit more effort because you have to know, you know, this part weighs some amount, this part weighs some amount, wh where would it end up? And you can't just add up individual parts. No, this is a terrible baseball bat. I'm going to erase it. It shouldn't exist. Um, you can't just add up individual point particles because there's an infinite number of them, effectively. So what we're going to do is we're going to model systems like this um, as a simple, as, as we're going to model all, to all systems like this that have this property that two of the three uh, center of mass coordinates are obvious. We're going to model those systems as basically a simple rod with perhaps a varying mass density. So when I say mass density, this just means how much mass is in a given length. So in the example of the baseball bat, God, I'm going to have to do this again. Uh, no, I'm not going to draw a baseball bat. I'm going to draw a, uh, no, I'll, I'll draw a baseball bat. OK, this is a baseball bat. Actually, no, it's a chicken wing or a, a drumstick. This is a drum, this is a drum, a, a drumstick, right? It's a perfectly cylindrically symmetric drumstick. Um, so what we would do is we would say, OK, in a given segment of length here, how much mass does it have? That might have more mass than a given segment of length, a, a, a given segment of some other length here. And on the end, you'll have even more, more length. And so what we do is we would instead just treat this as a rod, you know, same, same size everywhere, but it's more dense over here and it's less dense here and, you know, more dense over here. And that would that would do enough. That would match the uh, if if we could match that property, then or if we could match the density in each slice, then this would be a perfectly good good model, and it would let us find the center of mass of the baseball bat. We would just need to figure out a way to determine how dense is it here, like how how dense should it be in this segment, in order to match the fact that it's thicker here. And we can talk about that in a little bit of detail. But first, let's just try to solve this problem. If you have a rod whose density is changing throughout the rod, assume the rod is thin and uh, and everything, then then where is the center of mass? Like if it was lead on one end and if it was aluminum on the other end, then you would know that the that the center of mass should be closer to the lead side. And the question is, where should it be? So let's just take a quick a quick detour inside a detour to talk about density. So density. is the notion of how closely packed something is. So for the sake of this for the sake of this quarter and this course, we're actually only going to be talking about mass density, i.e. how closely packed is one unit of mass to another unit of mass. But in 9C, you'll learn about another type of density called charge density, which is just how close is one unit of charge to another unit of charge? And so you can have all sorts of densities. It's, it's just a measure of how closely packed certain things are to each other. Now, there's this notion of a uniform density. And all that means is that the somethings 
are evenly distributed or evenly spaced. If the density does change at different places, like if you have aluminum on one side and lead on the other side, well, now the density isn't the same everywhere. It's heavier on one side than it is on the other. There, there, there's more mass close together on the right side than there is on the left side. And so in fact, if it's not uniformly dense, then we describe the density with a density function. So a density function just tells you at a particular place in space, the density is this value here, right? So we know what the, like you could go Google the density of lead, right? I don't, I don't actually know what it is off the top of my head, but it's pretty heavy. It's like 18 grams per cubic centimeter, I want to say, maybe. Um, and the density of aluminum is like four or something. So, um, or I don't even know, but whatever it is, the point is, is if you, the density function takes as input, not quite, so you need to know a little bit more. The density function takes as input to find a, a position and outputs what the density is at that position. So if you just took a really in, itty bitty tiny little volume of space or, or length of length of space or whatever, it would tell you what the uh, approximately what the density is in that itty little bitty region region because you know you get density by dividing a quantity in this case mass by a volume. But if the density is changing, you can only ever approximate it for it, like it's not constant at any one place. So you'd have to just look at an itty bitty region. And this is where infinitesimals come in. So in our case, um, because we're only considering a thin rod, i.e. something that only varies in one direction, the density only changes along the long axis. Or it only really can change along the long axis. We're assuming that it's uniform. Uh, the cross sections of the rod, rod are uniform. And let's say that this is the x-axis, just for, just so we give it a name. So then the mass density function, we call it a mass density function because the type of density is a mass density. It's not a charge density. The mass density function only depends on x. Right? It only depends on where along the rod the object is. Now, the question is, is, what would be the most useful set of units to describe here? Well, we, we don't care how thin the rod is. We just want to know how much does a, a length of rod weigh? What is the mass of a single of, of a length of rod? So if we wanted to just describe our density in terms of length, our density, the units for our density, by the way, you guys might be used to density having units of kilograms per cubic meter. The units that we would use, because we only care about how the density varies in the x direction, would be kilograms for kilograms per meter. Yes, this isn't this is an imaginary rod. It's it's just like some physical rod that you have, right? We only care about the we only care about um, the mass of a given length of rod because we assume that the rod is uniform about its cross section, it has a fixed width and everything. So it's it's enough to just know how much a given length of rod weighs. We don't need to know how much a given volume of rod weighs because that, that, that's excess information that we just don't care about. It, it involves things like the cross-sectional area of the rod, but that's not important for figuring out the location of the center of mass. So we actually give this function, the linear or the mass density that only depends on a variable x, we give it a name, we call it the linear mass density. And it has a symbol associated with it. It's a Greek letter lambda. It looks like a I don't, I don't know what it looks like. It looks like that. And it's a function of x. It only depends on the horizontal position along the rod. So if, the, if lambda, the function, is large on the right-hand side, that tells you that it's denser on the right-hand side. If it's, uh, if, it's smaller, if it's small in the middle and then large on either end, it tells you that it's denser on either end and less dense in the middle. So this characterizes the density. And in a sense, it would kind of like, um, <clears throat> In a sense, it would like kind of tell you like how the mixture of the ob of the object's materials uh, like change. So like if you had 100% aluminum on one side and 100% lead on the other side, 
And then you smoothly went from 100% down to 99% and 1%, 98%, 2%, all the way over to the other side. Then this would tell you how the density changes and it would just increase linearly, right? Because the density would change as the ratios change. So just as a, as a, a, point, of a point of contention, if the density is uniform, meaning that all of the mass is evenly distributed, that means that the, that the linear mass density is constant. Lambda of x equals lambda naught. Just a, typically a subscript of zero means it's just a constant, which is a constant. And that just tells you that the linear or that the mass density is the same everywhere. The linear mass density is the same everywhere. In that case, if everywhere has the same density, then you can just find the mass if you know the volume. M would just be equal to lambda naught times L, where L is the length. If the density is not constant, then lambda x is just some function. It's just like maybe it's uh, maybe it's I don't know lambda naught x plus five or something or nine x minus two or sine of x. It's just some function, right? It, it's just some function that tells you how the density changes as you move along the x-axis. But in that case, because the density changes, you can't just multiply the density by the length to get mass because which value of density would you pick? You'd have to, in some sense, you'd have to like find an average density. So, so you could integrate if you wanted to find the mass, but, and, and we, will, we will get to that, but there's an easier way to, to describe this notion. And it's just how much does a really, really thin slice of the rod um, weigh? And that we can do because you can approximate any function as a constant, right? Like lambda of x is, is very, very close to lambda of x, right? Uh, or lambda of, of lambda of x plus dx is very very close to lambda of x is all I'm saying. So for an infinitesimal length of rod dl, we yeah this is getting to calculus though. So let's say that we're looking at just a really thin slice of the rod. The mass depends on where that slice is. So we would write dm, and maybe I, this isn't always done, but sometimes I like to do this, where I write that it's a, that the, the small amount of mass that it has depends on where it is, so it's a function of x. This would be equal to lambda of x dl, where dl is the length. And typically, by the way, we will choose dl to be dx. Let me actually just make that assumption now. It doesn't have to be. Like, like if, if x isn't your variable, then it doesn't have to be. But the point is, is you take the small, very, very small length at a position x, and you multiply the density by that very, very small length. And this just tells you what the, what the small mass is. So you might be asking now, why are we talking about this? Well, remember, for objects that have, or that are continuously, that don't have like individual particles with mass, in some sense, we need a way to be able to break up our, break up the object into really itty bitty tiny pieces so that we can add up the locations of those pieces, do, a, do a, a weighted average of the location of those pieces to find the center of mass. So let me be explicit. So we're going to, like I just said, we're gonna break, break up the rod into infinitely many small chunks of mass dm and at position x. So I can't draw infinitely many small chunks. What I can do is I can draw a few small chunks. So we break up our rod into small chunks. Let's say that this position is at x equals 0. And then um, let's say that uh, how can the center of mass be modeled as a function? We're not modeling the center of mass as a function. We're modeling the density as a function. Um, so this maybe, maybe this is x. Maybe that block is x1. This block is x2. This block is x3, and so on. And then over here, we would have x infinity. You know, there's an infinite number of these. And this position is now at x equals l. So our density function um, starts off at x equals 0. So the, the left end would have density lambda of 0. And the right side would have density lambda of l, 
capital L. And then the masses here, oh, uh, this should go up top, x equals L. The masses of each of these blocks might be dm1. This one might be dm2, this one might be dm3, so on and so forth. And then over here, this would be like dm infinity, you know, like this is, this is a very rough, but the idea is you just break it up into chunks. And then we can apply the, uh, the method that we did way, ab way above, where you just have a whole bunch of very, very small point particles at various positions and we just find their center of mass. dm is the, is the mass of the small chunk of length dx at position x. So then if we do this, the x coordinate of the center of mass is dm1 x1 plus dm2 x2 plus dot 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 divided by dm1 plus dm2 plus dot dot dot. This is, this is all we did. We're just making we're just adding up a bunch of infinitesimally small things now. Oh, and by the way, the last one would be, you know, uh, dm infinity, x infinity. So clearly this involves an, an integral. This is a limit. This is, we, we take the limit of a, of a finite sum and this takes a Riemann sum and makes it into an integral. And so, and that integral depends on the position x of the object. So we're integrating a whole bunch of things along or as we vary from one side x equals zero to the other side x equals l. So we can actually just rewrite that as an integral. So the horizontal center or the the x coordinate of the center of mass would be an integral from zero to l. Now we want to add up the, the terms that we add up are the mass at position x times the position x. So this would be dm of x, that's the mass of position x, times position x. And then we divide by the, again, it's an integral, but this time we're just adding up the masses, an integral from 0 to L of dm of x. Now, we have already established what dm of x is. This is just the mass, the, the, the infinitesimal mass at position x. That is, it's just lambda x dx. So in this case, we can simplify these integrals or rewrite them rather. So this would be lambda of x x dx divided by an integral from 0 to L of lambda x dx. And so this is the center of mass along a rod with one end at x equals 0 and the other end at x equals L. This is the, the horizontal, or this is the x, x coordinate of the center of mass. Um, note that like if, if your rod doesn't start at x equals 0 and doesn't end at x equals L, let's say it starts at x equals negative L and ends at x equals L, maybe it has length 2L, then this formula would have to change. You'd need like a minus L on one side and you, you, you know, your bounds would have to change. And maybe, maybe your coordinate, maybe you didn't start at x equals 0. Maybe you started off at something else. The, the, the point is, is you have to figure out what type of integral to do. But the idea is just you're integrating your bounds your bounds are from one end of your rod to the other end. And then the, uh, the thing that you're integrating is this small chunk of L or small chunk of mass times the position. And then you divide by an integral of just the mass. Now, as someone, by the way, astutely noted, this thing, integrating from zero to L of, D of, of dm of x, that's just adding up all of the infinitesimal masses for the entire rod. This just is the total mass of the rod. And so you could, you could do that. But then you have to know some more things. So we might just, we may as well just leave it this way, at least for now. So I'd like to work an example. Um, actually, let's work a, uh, so there's a simple example that I laid out in the, um, no, actually, let's do the simple example. Um, and by the way, there's a ton of these examples in like books and so on. So let's, let's try to find the center of mass position of a uniform rod uniform meaning that its dense, density is constant, of length 2L and mass M centered at x equals 0. So the picture is you have your rod. You have x equals 0 here. You have x equals L here. And x equals minus L over here. OK, where's the center of mass? So you guys have the intuition, hopefully, that the center of mass is in the middle. But let's check that our formula gives us the correct answer. <clears throat> so 
generally, it's true that dm is lambda of x dl, where dl is just some uh, some uh, cor some some length. But because we're working along the x-axis, we can just work with dl being dx. So because it's uniform, as I've already established, it means that the that the density function is constant. Now we don't know what that what that constant is yet, but we don't need to know it. It turns out you could find it. By the way, it'd be relatively straightforward to do. But you don't actually need to know it. Instead, we can just do this integral explicitly. So our integral in this case is an integral from one end of the rod to the other end. So in this case, it's negative L to L of lambda naught x dx. So it's lambda of x, which is lambda naught, times x dx, divided by an integral from, again, from minus L to L of just lambda naught dx. And so the lambda naughts are going to cancel out. Like You can just factor them out of the integral, and then they can you can just cancel them because they're the same number. And so it, that's why you didn't need to know what lambda naught was. And so this just becomes an integral of from L to from minus L to L of x dx divided by the integral minus L to L of dx. So we can do this integral. It's, you know, it'd be one half x squared evaluated from minus L to L divided by 2L. And so this is one half L squared minus negative L squared divided by 2L. And this is just zero, right? So this just says that the center of mass position of this rod is zero, which is exactly where we expected it to be, right? It was e it has equal mass on either side, so the center of mass should be exactly in the middle. Now we could do uh, a separate computation. Um, how are we actually making on? How are we, how are we on time? Not great. Um, we could do a separate computation uh, where let's say the rod is non-uniform. Well, then the only thing that changes is well. Either you'd have to be given lambda of x, or you'd have to find it. And then it, you just change what this is. And maybe it doesn't just cancel out. Maybe it's just some other function. Now, I, I wrote out the example in the lecture notes. I'm not going to go over it because you know we're, we're super behind. So I want to just move on ahead. But do go take a look at that afterwards. Um, there will be a homework problem that involves this type of calculation. I, you'll see that in discussion next week. So um, these types of things, it'll take practice to get, but you guys will get it eventually. OK, so that's the end of the detour. That's how you calculate the center of mass, which is what you need in order to talk about you know, notions like the center of mass um, momentum. So let's get back to momentum then, because that's where we were at the beginning of all of this. So we needed the center of mass discussion so that we could unpack this, uh, this, this thing that showed up in the impulse momentum theorem. So recall that the impulse momentum theorem is that the net external, or I won't write net, I'll just write external. The external impulse is equal to the change in the, in the center of mass momentum. So we need to be able to unpack this. And we needed this notion of center of mass to do that. So what we're going to do is we can treat the whole system as if it were just a single mass with all of its mass concentrated at the center of mass. So in that case, we get that the center of mass momentum is just the total mass times the center of mass velocity. This will be the total, the uh, the center of mass momentum. So uh, this is the speed at which the center of mass moves. And M, capital M again being the total mass. So quick reminder, V is the time derivative of the position vector, right? So that says that the momentum, the center of mass momentum, which is just m times vcm, that's just m times the time derivative of rcm. And we know how to calculate the center of mass position, r. This is m times the time derivative of m1 r1 vector plus m2 r2 vector plus dot, 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 divided by the total mass. These masses can cancel out. And what we're left with is we're left with uh, m1 dr1 vector dt plus m2 dr2 vector dt plus dot, dot, dot. And dr1 is just the speed of object 1. dr2 is uh, dt is just the speed of object 2. So this is m1 v1 plus m2 v2 plus dot, 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 as, uh, perhaps as expected. 
And M1 V1 is just the momentum of object one. And M2 V2 is just the momentum of object two. So this is to say, in a sense, the center of mass momentum is the total momentum of a system. I'm going to put this in quotes because it's not quite true, but it's, it's good enough. I mean, it is true, but it's, uh, it's a little bit subtle. So that's why I didn't label it p-tote, for example. So the impulse momentum, uh, th by the way, I am going to go a little bit late because you know we started 10 minutes late and we have stuff to cover. But if you have to leave, you have to leave. The impulse momentum theorem reads, no, it's total momentum isn't zero. The in impulse momentum theorem reads, It's that the external impulse is equal to the change in the center of mass momentum. And so that is, this is equal to the change in P1 plus the change in P2 plus dot, dot, dot. It's the change, it's, it's the sum of the changes in all of the constituent momenta. <clears throat> and so uh, if there is no external impulse, then that says that the change in the momenta, the total change in the momenta is zero. This the change is zero. And so we can actually just unpack these deltas. Remember delta means finest, fi finest, final minus initial. So we can actually put all of the finals on one side, all of the initials on the other side, and we're left with P1 before plus P2 before. So this is the in, these are the momenta initially plus dot, dot, dot equals P1 after plus P2 after plus dot, 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 which is to say, if there are no external impulses, <clears throat> then if you have some process, like if you have some, some time span where there are no external impulses, then if you know some initial, if you know the information about what happens before those impulses, before whatever happens happens, then you can find out what happens afterwards. Basically, if you know what happened beforehand and you know there are no external forces, then you can do algebra to find what happened afterwards, even if those momenta exchange with each other. Because this doesn't mean, this does not mean that P1 is the same as P, P1 before is the same as P1 after. It does not mean that P2 before is the same as P2 after. It just means that their sums are the same. So for example, one of them could lose all of its momentum and give it to the other one. The total is still the same. But, the, but something happened internal to the system that made them redistribute their momentum. So that's a super useful thing because if, as long as you choose a big enough system, you can almost always find a, uh, you can almost always find a system that has this property where the external impulse is zero, which is again, super useful. And we're gonna see how this is useful next week. So uh, just as a quick note, and I actually really don't like this, ex this explanation. There, there's a little bit that I wanted to talk about, about um, how center of mass ties into this. And there's a note on that in the lecture notes. Go and read it if you want. It involves a spring. But um, it's not actually uh, super 100% necessary, um, because I actually really don't like the explanation that I gave. The idea is that you can just, well, OK, let me actually do this one example. So the example of how center of mass ties in here is let's say that you have, a, you have two blocks attached to a spring and the spring is super compressed initially. So before your system looks like you have a block of mass M1 attached to a spring, which is compressed with a block of mass M2. And then afterwards you have your block of mass M1 going off this way, you have a spring and you have your block of mass M2 going off this way, right? So initially, this is after, initially, the whole system was at rest, which means that all of the constituent momenta were zero. So the whole system's momentum was zero. PCM subscript I, meaning initial, is zero. It's just a zero vector because not, nothing has any momentum. And because there are no external forces, the spring is internal to the system. We're assuming it's a massless spring, of course. And the only forces are the springs push, the spring pushing on the masses and the masses pushing back on the springs. the external forces are zero. 
which means that there are no external impulses. So if that's true, then that means that from the work energy theorem, sorry, not work energy theorem, impulse momentum theorem, that means that the change in the momentum is zero, which implies that the final momentum, of final center of mass momentum is zero because the initial center of mass momentum was zero. And so we can just write out what that final um, center of mass momentum is. It's the momentum of one object plus the momentum of the other object. And those have to equal zero. So the momentum of object of, with mass M1, the, this is the final momentum, would be M1 V1F in the minus I hat direction, plus this is the momentum of object two, M1, M2 V2 in the plus I hat direction. That should equal zero. And from the diagram, hopefully your intuition should tell you, M1 flew a lot further. So M2, or sorry, M1 flew a lot further. So it's probably lighter. So we can actually just use, we can use this equation to verify that relationship. We can solve for, uh, we can, oh, this should be v, V2F. We can solve for V1F from this equation. V1F is equal to minus, um, sorry, it shouldn't be minus sign. Uh, I need to fix that in notes. It's M2 V2F over M1. So in this case, we found just from, a just from momentum conservation that if M2 is bigger than M1, if M2 is, has a bigger mass, then that means that this ratio, M2 over M1, is greater than 1, which means that V1, or the block with mass M1, travels faster than the block with mass M2. And we found that just from momentum conservation. And we actually found exactly how much faster. So I'm going to end it there. I know I went six minutes over. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, that is a good place to have gotten to.